Well, what a great day. What an amazing experience just to watch um, these kids, these students that uh, we all have the opportunity to serve and, and raise as parents and as uh, church members to see them choose to follow Christ. I mean, what an amazing thing. And also, it's just like kind of, it was kind of surreal. Like we didn't necessarily plan on this, that, you know, my birthday would be the same day as a baptism, but there's just something so appropriate about it. And I was looking for a moment um, as to how many times a Sunday, the church started in 2010. So how many times it's been uh, the 17th of September on a Sunday? I think it's one other time. And so, you know, it happens every so often. Um, but it's, it's great. It's, it's fun. It's like, here I am. I'm 43, and we got a bunch of kids that are, you know, born again, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're being spiritually born for the first time. Like, this is, this is it. We're like, we're, we're celebrating their birth. Um, uh, that, that's what baptism is about, right? Baptism is not like, you know, necessarily the mechanism that births you, but it's the celebration, and it's kind of the the moment that you say, you know, I'm choosing to follow Christ. Like, that's my path. It's a decision. And, I, you know, we do baptism messages a lot, and we've taught about baptism and what it represents and why we do it. And there's so much history and so many wonderful things about baptism as you start to get into it. It's not just kind of a, a, a visual or a symbol that was just made up out of nowhere. It, it represents people moving out of slavery and into freedom like they did when they went through the Red Sea, you know, the, the uh, Israelites, that, that movement through water. And then again, from, from the wilderness and into the promised land through the Jordan. And there's just this great picture of kind of the world being created. The, the Bible says that there was water and chaos and darkness, and, and then the world sprung up out of the water. And so the picture of baptism is a picture of people saying like I was a certain way and headed down a certain path. And whether I knew it or not, I had a certain uh, author of my life or king or follower of, of whatever I was going to do. But now I'm choosing specifically to move away from that darkness, to move away from chaos and come forth. And the water represents where I was before and now where I'm headed into the newness of following God. And what's so great about these kids following Christ is it's just so early, right? It's so great to know that there are kids who have found the path early. You know, they, they, they're, they, they've made, they're making a choice. And that's when one of the things I think that's a distinction about our church is that we make sure that when kids get baptized or when they uh, start to move towards this relationship with Jesus and they, they, they pray to Jesus and they ask for forgiveness. And maybe you grew up and the way that you viewed that was that, you know, they're getting saved and, and, and all of that stuff, which is, which is true. But we, we want kids and we want everybody to understand that when you choose to follow Christ, it's not just a moment that represents a future somewhere. It's not just like, oh, now that I'm saved, you know, I can't wait. And that means no matter what, when I die, I get to go to the good place. Being baptized is about choosing to follow Jesus right now. That's what being saved is about. It's saying, I'm following Christ. He, he, that's the path. So think about that. Think about the path. Think about being lost. Think about being in the wilderness. Think about being out on the open waters with no compass. Think about being, you know, up in a mountain somewhere or in a city where you have no map and no phone or nothing. And think about the moment when you find the path. You know, it's like, there it is. We know which way to go. When a person follows Christ and they choose to make Jesus their king, their Lord, they pledge allegiance to Jesus, they're choosing Jesus as the author, the king of their life. And they're saying, he, I know which way I'm gonna go. Wherever he goes, I will go. I will follow Christ. I'm gonna take steps with Christ. I wanna live like Christ. I wanna find meaning and purpose the way that Christ designed me to have it. And so what an amazing thing for kids to find the path of Jesus so early, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way. I don't know about you parents, but like, I know a lot of people, and I think even in my childhood, it was like, I didn't quite understand that it was not just about a way somewhere, but a way through today. He's the way. 
He's the way for tomorrow. He's the way for Tuesday and Wednesday. And that's why he came. Not just so you can end up in a good place at some point, but so that you can start to become who you were designed to become today. Heaven on earth is actually the picture that Jesus paints. He paints, he, he tells us to pray about it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I allude to this all the time. I talk about this all the time, and it's such a difficult thing for us to wrap our minds around. I'm just gonna talk about it briefly this morning. Again, growing up in the church and being born again, and the moment you receive Christ and that, that date that it happened in ways at times was celebrated and often much more meaningful than the purpose of the rebirth. It's like, when did you get saved? And you say, that date. And what does that date mean? It means that's the date that I knew my future was secure. Not, that's the day I found the path to walk through life. Both are important. Both are critical. It's not just where you go, it's how you go and, and how you're gonna live every single day. And, and we celebrate our birthdays once a year, but if we never actually grew, right? We, it's good to celebrate your birthday. Happy birthday, thank you for the pickleball hat. I'm so happy. Great, love it. But if we never grew from there uh, and, and then started down beautiful path we were born for, wouldn't it be sad? And in fact, whenever some, someone that you know that you love is celebrating a birthday, but their birthday also is like the context for pain or the context for maybe unmet potential or for maybe disaster or for sickness or for something, there's something weird about that birthday because it's like, ah. Uh, something's not going right here. And, and so what does that mean internally? It means that when someone is born, that it's beautiful. It's a beautiful moment. And birth is beauty. And birth is also potential. And it's simply the beginning. And um, I actually had a, a friend for a long time who we would, as when I was a student pastor, we would talk about this, about the significance of baptism and what it meant for your future. And um, he, he would use really, really colorful, almost grotesque um, imagery, but I'll kind, of, I'll kind of flatten it a little bit. You know, if, if it's all about just being baptized, then basically if, if it was really just all about being baptized, because that means that when you die, you get to go to heaven, which is where you're ultimately supposed to be forever, then basically what we should do is baptize you and then just go start digging your grave and put you in it as soon as possible. Just get you there. Which is kind of a weird thought, isn't it? Like you're like, what in the world? Why would you do that? Well, because that, that's kind of what we have in our mind that, it's, that that's what life is all about. But when we understand that, we go, that's not what life is about. Life is about God giving us this world, our bodies, this earth, and being made in his image and then us going off that track and then the whole story of Jesus's life on earth is to get us back on track. I just did a whole ser series on that. That's the point. And so we think like, I was born for this. What were you born for? It's not just that you were born. What were you born for? You were born physically to image God to be made in his likeness, to live like him, to be transformed and to act like Christ, to be a human who embodies the goodness of God physically. That's why you were born. Well, but because of sin and death, we're spiritually dead when we're physically alive in the sense that we have a broken relationship with God. It doesn't mean we're not spirit beings. But then what needs to happen is the, the severed relationship and the sinful reality of our, of our lives and our desires and our pathways need to be put back on track. And so Jesus comes into this world to take that which is so beautiful and good and uh, take on sin, take on death and evil and bring us his spirit, which can now take us and transform us into his likeness. And so we start to be transformed right now walking down the path right now. And one day we physically die and we will be resurrected on this earth, resurrected in physical bodies. And the kingdom of God will come back and heaven and earth will be back together fully as it is now just partially. And that's the picture. And so I was born for this. I was born for what? Well, you just read a passage where Jesus talks about being born again. He talks about it. You're physically born and then you're, and then you're spiritually born. And this is with a man who's a Pharisee. He's a teacher. 
He, uh, he's the one that's supposed to be telling everybody what life is all about. That's kind of the, the backdrop. That's kind of the energy in Jesus' voice. Like, you're a Pharisee. Like, you're a leader. Like, how do you not know what life is all about? You have to have a relationship with God in order for you to be about what life is all about. You hear me? That's what Jesus is saying. You have to have a relationship with God. You have to have, a, you have to have an engagement with the spirit of the living God. Like, you know, you know Nicodemus, like, you're a Pharisee. Like, you're, you're a leader. Like, you understand the power and the meaning of the presence of the, the, the spirit of God. Your whole, your whole tabernacle system was about the spirit of God and the temple and the spirit of God. And, and, and it's all about the spirit of God having the presence of God with us. He's like, don't you know that someone now can, can have the spirit of God living in them and they need that and they have to have that? You should be the one that's telling everybody that, they, that that's kind of what they need. And he hits two things. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So what am I born for? No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Not go to the kingdom of God exclusively, which he says this very tell you, no one will enter the kingdom of God, but see it. He's saying that you're supposed to be seeing the kingdom of God right now. That's what you were born for. You're supposed to be seeing heaven on earth right now. That's what you were born for. You wanna be a part of the kingdom of God on earth? That's why you gotta be born again. You need the spirit of the living God to be a part to transform you so that you can bring about the goodness of God into the world. That's why you need that. No one will, no one will be a part of bringing the he heaven to earth and, and making this place beautiful unless they're born again. No one will be the path. No one will act like Christ unless they're born again. You need God in your life. Can I just say that? You need God. We need God, don't we? We need him. We can't see the kingdom. We can't see lives changed. We can't see justice brought. We can't see kindness manifested. We can't see the life that all, the, the, there's poppings and growings and realities of the kingdom of God all around us and, and in the heart of every single one of those are people who are born again, who are seeing the kingdom because people are going, we're gonna live a different life. We're gonna be peculiar and we're gonna love people and we're gonna be kind and we're gonna be hospitable and we're gonna like do life differently and I don't know about you, but when I'm around people who really love God, I'm seeing the kingdom of God. I think when you watch a kid get baptized, you're seeing the kingdom of God. And so it's important for you to understand that we're born again to bring the kingdom in. We're born again to bring the kingdom in. Why am I born? Not just to have one day that means I get to end up in the kingdom. You're born again to see the kingdom now. You're born again to build for the kingdom now. That's what it's for. Born again to bring the kingdom in. And here's the thing about the kingdom, and you know when you see it, and this is where I want to go and just live here for a second. The kingdom of God is filled with joyful celebration. The kingdom of God is filled with joyful celebration, isn't it? Celebration, joy, goodness. And here's the part I want to get to you, and this is going to be a little bit of a left turn, and I just want you to hang with me for a second. The reality of joy, and when Jesus comes to this earth and, earth and he does certain things that bring about celebration, which we'll look at, there's a backdrop to that joy. There's something that makes the joy the joy. You don't just have joy in a vacuum. You understand? It has contrast. If you just have joy, but nothing to hold joy next to, maybe you might say it this way, joy is always, it's always joyful, then that's not joy. Joy actually pops off of the landscape in contrast to something. And it's how we know it's joy. It's the opposite of something. It's the, it's the comparable better than something. To put it simply, joy comes through suffering. Joy is found to be joy because of the absence of the suffering that joy represents. When we're in pain, we feel pain. It's real. And then when we have joy in the midst of that pain, 
That's even more real. And where did that come from? And the gift of Jesus is not simply just that we will right now and immediately erase all the suffering, but that he will bring joy in the suffering. That that suddenly now, in the pain, in the problems, in the challenges, in Christ, there can be this experience of goodness and celebration with the backdrop of pain. Joy comes through suffering. You might say this way, suffering and joy are two sides of the same coin. You understand? You, understand? you, you, you wouldn't feel joy if you didn't have pain. It's like you're living in pain and we all have pain and I'm 43 and I feel more pain. People ask me, does it feel different to be 43? I'm like, I don't know, I, I don't know. I definitely feel more pain every day than I did 10 years ago. Right, it's just, right? It's more pain, so I guess that's what it is. But we're living in, in, a, in a life that takes a lot of energy and it's, it's painful, it hurts. Relationships are painful, they're difficult. Life brings about lots of obstacles. And then for the Christ follower, there is in the midst of that a joy, a peace, a celebratory possibility and reality in the midst of the suffering. Has anybody ever been suffering or in pain, but because of Christ, they've experienced something that you might call beautiful. And you might think to yourself, in this suffering, in this pain that I have, I can't imagine getting through this without Christ because in the midst of the pain, I have something that helps me through the pain. You see, as a Christian, when Christians suffer, and this is something that, I'm gonna write an entire series on, but just gonna live in this for a second. When Christians suffer, they see themselves as part of the same work that Jesus did on the cross that exhausts evil. Part of the same work. In Romans, it says this. This isn't my Romans passage, so just stay here. This is a different one. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Hang with me. Christians in the New Testament, book of Acts, Paul, saw themselves, this is wild, as privileged to suffer because it represented an overlap of the ages. Suffering is here, and so joy is moving in. It's really fascinating you might talk to people all over the world who are experiencing tremendous suffering. And yet because of Christ, they will tell you that they've experienced a joy that maybe you and I who may not have suffered greatly, you kind of wonder, well, do I, do I have to suffer to be a Christian? Well, I think part of life is you're just gonna suffer and God shows up and just even in the regular sufferings of life. And do I have to go through trials and tribulations? Not necessarily, but what, what we find is that throughout the world, personally, in relative to world and what suffering can be, I've not suffered that much. But, you know, when we see people that really suffer, that are Christians who are followers of Christ and they suffer greatly, they have a depth of testimony and story about the joy of Jesus in the midst and the presence of Jesus in the midst of that suffering that is hard for those of us who maybe haven't suffered to that degree to comprehend. You talk about people who are really suffering and you talk to them, they're in jail, they lost children, in, and they go, I feel peace, though, the peace of God in the midst of this. And so it's this two sides of the same coin. It's like there's a suffering and then God brings joy in. And then if you suffer more, it's almost like there's more joy and they push together. And so joy has this reality that lives with the backdrop. This is a mystery, but the mystery is stamped by the gospel. Listen to this. When Jesus turned water into wine, raise your hand if you've heard the story of Jesus' first miracle in John chapter two, going to a wedding, they run out of wine, and he fills up these 
these big jars with water and he turns the water into the best wine. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that story. Right, we know the story. That's what Jesus did. It was his first miracle. Listen, when Jesus turned water into wine, it provoked joy. There was something missing. There was something wrong. And he showed up in the midst of the wrong and brought the joy. Now, if they already had a bunch of wine lined up and they didn't run out of it, if Jesus would have added to that, you might've had some people that could taste the difference between whatever they were drinking and whatever he brought. But it was so much greater than that. They had no wine. They ran out. He turned the water into wine. They had lost the wine. It was gone. The mom's freaking out. The whole, the whole party's going, what are we gonna do? The celebration is over. And Jesus turns the water into the wine and it provokes celebration. It brings about joy. These two things are connected. It wasn't just a couple of words spoken by Jesus or a simple miracle. It came by way of God, listen, emptying himself of his divine attributes, leaving the heavenly realm to serve humanity. That's why the water got turned into wine because God emptied himself and Jesus was actually physically at the wedding and not sitting at the right hand of the father. He left that. He took on the form of, of a human being. He emptied himself of his divine attributes. He felt pain and suffering. So he's not just there doing a miracle to show off how great God is. He's doing it at tremendous expense. Tremendous expense. Leaving the heavenly realm to serve humanity. You might see him as a superhero, but he is headed to Gethsemane to be the super servant. And he knows it when he says, go fill the jars with water. I want you to understand the blood shot, almost like just the reality of Jesus in that moment. And what he's gonna bring is tremendous celebration. He's gonna turn water into water. He's gonna make something great. And all of it, he's stepping back, watching his children enjoy the goodness of what he is bringing into their lives at his expense of suffering tremendously. There's a link between suffering and joy. It costs something. The author of Jesus says that, that it, or the author of Hebrews says that the joy of his children celebrating is why he suffered. He suffered to bring joy. Fixing our eyes on Jesus in Hebrews 12, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Joy and the cross in the same sentence. James 1, this is one now that you can start to look at the problems that you have, and you can start to see that actually this blend, this kind of mystery of suffering in the world and what it can bring about is something about your perspective and your ability to metabolize your pain. James, the brother of Jesus, says this, consider it what pure, anyone know? What does James say? Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, pure joy. Anybody ever experienced pure joy? Like pure joy? Anybody ever associate that directly with trials and tribulations and suffering? This is where the Christian's view of the world and understanding of what's going on around us is supposed to have evolved to a mature level that makes us stand and set apart in the way we live and what hope we bring to people. Consider it pure joys, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So now through suffering, we have perseverance. Has anybody ever persevered? Have you ever persevered from something? 
Man, have you ever finished a marathon? Have you ever gone through a treatment that was horrible? Have you ever gone through like a relational experience that's painful? Have you ever had like some type of illness and you made it through? Have you ever like, I don't know, gone to school and then like finished and got your degree? Have you, whatever it is, have you ever finished the project and got the rate? Have you ever persevered? Did any of it ever come into your life without pain? Never. You want joy? You have to see pain differently. Consider it pure joy, pure joy. Woo! Bye guys! Let's go! Pure joy, like when, when, when Marvin Harrison took off and he ran faster than any guy that has run on a football field in the NFL or college yesterday. Did you know that? That's pure joy. Right? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe a better example. Pure joy when you face various trials. Knowing that it produces something so that you can be complete and mature. So the mature person doesn't lack suffering or lack joy. Joy is the result of suffering metabolized in a healthy way. Romans says this, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's what our mouths, and that's what we should be excited about. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Glory in our sufferings. Come on, let's be real. Let's be real. Come on. We're, this is hard to understand, isn't it? Huh? Huh? Glory in your, what? Glory in your sufferings. The only way you're gonna glory, the only way you're gonna consider it joy when you suffer is when you understand what suffering brings about. In the story of Jesus turning water into wine, it was his expense that brought the celebration. In the world that we live in, it will be the expense that brings about the celebration. So our disposition towards the expense is what matters. Sometimes the expense shows up and the pain shows up unsolicited. And we have the opportunity to metabolize that experience knowing that what it will do, if we can endure it and understand it and let it test us and change us, will bring about joy. This is what the whole new heaven and new earth is about. Look what it says in Revelation. I'm just gonna read it. This is like when heaven and earth come back together. There, John is looking up, he's got a vision and he sees the kingdom of God coming back to earth, which is where we're all headed. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will what? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What are those tears about? They are the tears of suffering mixed with joy flowing down the face. There was suffering. There was pain. The expense was great. Jesus paid it. I paid it. This was hard, but transformed into the likeness of Christ. We now glimpse forward into the joy, the celebration of eternal relationship and presence with God that all is a result of the suffering that brought us to that point. So one eye has suffering and one eye, it, it cries joy and we are happy and we are glad it's over. But the only reason we're glad it's over is because it was so hard and we wouldn't know how great the joy was if it wasn't so hard. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying. Why are they crying? Because there was mourning and death and pain. And from that backdrop, joy, Jesus gently calls every one of us 
Life is an obstacle and every day I'm moving towards maybe prepping for my biggest problem. You know, I, I, what I wanna leave you with is just look at your pain differently. You were born for this, to see the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it is, it is found and seen with joyful celebration. And every one of those joyful celebrations comes from someone's expense, the water into wine. Whatever you're bringing about, it's gonna cost you. You're not gonna have kids that grow up and graduate one day and absolutely love you and it didn't cost you anything to figure out how to talk to them, to figure out how to love them, to figure out how to shape them, to figure out how to make it so they don't absolutely think you're the most detestable weirdo in the world. It will cost you. You will have to think, you will have to spend, you will have to drive to Pickerington three times in one day. And then that expense will turn to the overflow. Every moment that you're in life, you can metabolize it in a way. A couple thoughts, don't take the path of least resistance. Never take the path of least resistance. Do you hear me? Just because it's the least resistance. Life will have lots of resistance and you need to get ready for it. Life will have lots of resistance and you need to get ready for it. So you need to go down the pathway of purpose, doing something that matters, spending, your, expensing your life on something that when it f comes to fruition, birth celebration, you might as well down the pathway to life, go somewhere that matters. It's gonna be painful whether you try to or not. Go somewhere that matters. Channel the expense. Channel the pain. Go down. Carve something out. Dig, plan, work every day. Expend yourself to bring about the joy. Don't take the path of least resistance. Don't just seek the comfort. Let the comfort come as a result of the pain you intentionally choose to build something that matters. Spend money on the right things, spend energy on the right things to make something that makes a difference. Spend it on God and the goodness of God in other people's lives. And then this is just a little thing as a practice. Do little difficult things daily to train for difficult things. This is literally part of how kind of, I sort of grew up, I had this kind of epiphany like, I can't just like do everything that I want, right? I gotta do something that matters. And life is difficult. And so you can ask anyone that is close to me, every single day, now this is just a little example, every single day I eat six hard-boiled eggs that are prepackaged from Kroger. <laughs> every day. It's my breakfast. Every single day I do it. I wash it down with water. People that are in my presence are disgusted by the process. And I don't enjoy it. I do it every day just because I'm like, I know this is good. I need, it's like 36 grams of protein, starting off on a good step. And you know what? Don't just do everything that comes easy, Joel. Do something that's helpful, even if it costs a little bit. Weeping may remain for the night, but joy, it comes in the morning. Suffering, joy. We are born again to bring the kingdom in. You want to see the kingdom of God, the way that Jesus says we are all born to see it? You got to expend your, yourself. You got you to see suffering a certain way. You got to spend your life. I love that life wants to take us and kill us and destroy us, but that God would say, no, you can spend yourself and come alive and be who I made you to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the reality of birth, for all of the people who are in this room today, that we are, we're here, God. We're, it's a miracle that we're here. We're, we're, we're like in the flesh, alive. We were born. We all took that journey and here we are. And we thank you for these kids 
who had that moment not too long ago, and here they are being born again, choosing the pathway of Jesus to bring about the kingdom. Help them to see that their choice is not the easy choice. It's the meaningful choice. It's the best choice. It's the purpose-filled choice. Help them all to spend their lives bringing about the goodness of God and not just whatever is comfortable, whatever feels good in the moment, whatever is short-sighted. Help us to all grow and mature and become more like you. Thank you, Jesus, for that moment when you turned the water into wine. I can only imagine you sitting back and probably not even partaking of it just to watch the people enjoy your goodness and all the while you're sitting there knowing I'm away from my father right now. I've given up everything right now. But I want to do it because of the look on their faces. Thank you for spending on us so that we could experience joy. We look forward to seeing you fully face to face. And in the meantime, God, help us to be the people who build for your kingdom that is on its way. Thank you for these kids. Bless them and protect them in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have an amazing day, all right? Happy birthday. I went under 40 minutes. Thank you so much for watching. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your prayer requests. We want you to text the number below and say hi. Thank you so much for watching.